Hi everyone, welcome to Brew Academy. We're about all things tea. But tea is more than just a hot beverage. It's also about relationships. It's about inspiration, like the inspiration my father received from this incredibly wonderful herb and the taste, goodness and purpose in each sip of tea. So today we present the first of Brew Academy's Brewing Inspiration Conversations. We are going to talk inspiration to people from Sri Lanka and around the world. That means inspiration in entrepreneurship, in the environment, in climate action, and of course, how they like to take their tea. My guests at Brew Academy today are none other than Sri Lanka's most famous author and his daughter, soon to be her most famous jazz musician, Ashok Ferry and Q. Thank you for joining me to tea. Thanks for inviting us, Dilan. Okay, so we have to start where every tea should start, with his with some tea. I hope you drink tea, Q. Yes. You told me an interesting story of how you start your performances. I, yeah, actually, because for so many years I didn't drink tea, but then once I started uh, doing gigs regularly, I found that drinking like herbal tea before performance really helped the throat. And also if my voice isn't feeling so good, then tea is very, very good to uh, calm it down. So <laughs> it's preventive from getting sore or anything. So yeah. Well, tea is also loaded with a lot of good stuff, so don't forget that it's good for your voice and good for your body as well. Yeah. Now, you told me an interesting story about your dad and the way he takes his tea. <laughs> with lots and lots of sugar. Okay, so... <laughs> and milk? Um, <laughs> sure. Well, it's interesting at hotels, like we're always stealing half the sugar sachets and stuff for him. <laughs> no, no, no. I drink, I drink builder's tea or sergeant major's tea. The spoon has to be able to stand up in the middle of the tea. It should be so really thick with sugar and milk. You know, because of the great respect I have for you and your work... You I'm have not me out of the room. I'm not going to offer you either milk or sugar. Oh my goodness. Because this can this work is, on its own. This is torture. <laughs> this is because you understand. Actually, it's going to be something quite different. Because I'm going to ask you to truly appreciate the tea. The, the tea. When you take sugar with tea, it completely dilutes the natural goodness. Try a little bit of honey. Try a lemon, um, orange rind. You can take mint. Uh, so many different ways. You talked about builder's tea. And you also, amongst your many accomplishments, is that of a builder. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Sanjay and, and where the inspiration for Sanjay in his building role came. Because to me, it is exactly like everything I saw in London in the 1980s. You have captured it incredibly um, beautifully, um, but also accurately. It's accurate to a point where I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, in every page, it's like these oh my gosh moments. Like, how did you get that gosh, detail? Thank you for saying that, Dilan, because I have been criticized for, for producing an imaginary world there. What happened was, um, I read Pure Maths at Oxford, came down, I didn't have a visa to stay on in England. It's a very quick uh, thing. I ended up completely by accident, randomly, as a builder's laborer. Now, I've been lucky through various stages of my life to live in different kind of atmospheres, different sections, completely unrelated to each other, totally random. And this was an area that for 20 years, actually longer, 30, 30, 40 years, I, I've kept it at the back of my head. And one thing about being a writer is you keep it there, it's like a bank, and you need to put it down at some point. Once you do put it down, you feel you've laid it to rest. So all these memories that you talk about are actually from real life. Almost all of them, particularly the London bits, are almost absolutely lifted from life. But actually reading it, I know you've been called the king of Kolpiti, amongst ah. other things. I read that this morning. Listen to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, I mean, that's quite an accolade. The uncrowned <laughs> king of Kolpiti said a very eminent reviewer, so I, I love what you have done and really congratulations. But tell me, what's it like living with uh, a father who is also a writer? 
Oh my God! Now you're gonna get it. You asked for it. How much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Oh God. It's so interesting. I mean, I credit because I mean, both my parents are quite artistic. So growing up was, you know, I got exposed to a lot of culture, and you know, I think it's because of them that both my brother and I are, you know, he's he's a filmmaker and an actor. I. Well, I'm a musician and you know I mean I like to act as well and dance and I, so I long for them to be either a doctor a lawyer or an accountant then I wouldn't have to work anymore you see now you're becoming I Sanjay <laughs> I'm becoming Sanjay or Sanjay's I, dad yes yeah. I, I, I longed for that would it did it happen no. no I should be working for the rest of my life keeping these two in the style to which they were never accustomed you know I, I remember once once having dinner with a girl uh, um, in North London, I was in South London. I drove up in my little escort van, uh, which has two doors at the back. It's a real builder's van, you know. Um, had dinner, and then I think I came back. The next day, my mother calls from Sri Lanka because my aunt in Kandy had reported that I'd had dinner in London. How's that? In pre-email. That is, a you know, that's beautiful. And, and I thought to myself, wow. What have, what's with these Sri Lankan aunties, you know? Amazing. They are incredible. Now, Auntie network going strong, no? Absolutely. Now, Q, before your father strategically interrupted uh, your explanation of what it's like, <laughs> please do continue. Oh, no, no. I mean, so besides like growing up with a lot of culture, I think we all, because we're, we're all artists, there are a lot of emotions running high in the household, so it's easy to butt heads, I think, all the time. But uh, other than that, it's, you know, we all learn to try and get along. I was going to say, it's interesting, both, both my children, I mean, they're both artists, they have different persona outside of the family than they do inside, do you know? And again, I think that's a sort of um, protective mechanism. Both of you are much more... I'm more snappy. Buzzy, but, but you're more buzzy <laughs> outside, aren't you? You both, you and Rahan. I'm an artist. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I love it. Now you have been described as someone who writes, sings and performs uh, for people um, to prick their conscience or maybe with purpose. Um, I didn't get the exact context of that. This was in the Artra magazine where they described you as such. I mean, that's nice. That's great that you, you because I think more people should think about what they do before they do it. Yeah, but clearly definitely. you do. Tell us a little bit more. Why do you sing and why do you perform? What, what excites you about it? Oh, wow, it's a, ooh, it's, it's a very deep question. Why do I sing and perform? You know, I got into singing because I was very good at also performing, I think, when I was young and I liked to entertain. So singing just felt like a natural progression into it. And I also really liked listening to music. And that love only deepened when I went to university and started listening broadly as well. Um, so it just felt like a natural progression because at the same time I was studying English and drama. So writing and then also performing all just filtered into this. So it's kind of getting into music felt like just a natural progression of it all. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I bought out an album, sorry, mini album last year. And I think a lot of that was just about getting a lot of things, thoughts in my head onto paper and obviously into a song format. So, and I think I created the album mostly like for myself before anybody else. Um, I think you should like create a lot of the art for yourself. Um, but it's funny how a lot of the songs shaped up to be like my offering for women around me. And I did that very unconsciously, but it became, you know, something about something for the women around me because a lot of it is about talking about independence and you know making your own money as well so yeah in a way I, I create and I perform you know for myself to fulfill a part of my soul but then I can't deny there's a lot of me that really likes to entertain people too. There is this irony in Sri Lanka at least I observe it that uh, it is in every sense uh, a matriarchal society um, and yet there is a, a dearth of opportunity for women in many areas, even though their competence, their capability, their integrity is so uh, aptly uh, demonstrated. I mean, you see it wherever, you, particularly in the rural areas, and we see it in our foundation and so on. Tell me, is that changing? I mean, you are an example of the fact that it may be. What do you think generally? 
I think it's a very, very slow progression. That's what I'd say. I mean, didn't we already just um, Castor, she's like the first C female CEO like over here and like, well, that's been a long time coming considering how many women are in the corporate field, to be fair. Um, it's funny that you were talking about women in the rural areas because my cousin works in like urban planning and, uh, and also in rural areas and she says the, the entire, the entire, the village like pretty much would collapse without the help of women. To it too much because they keep everything going and annoying, just taking care of the children, you know, working a job, making sure all the food is cooked. Um, so I feel there there should be more opportunities for women, and I think definitely in the future there will, but it's a very slow progression at the moment. I was in Gaul two weeks ago, and I have the misfortune of having a vehicle where um, the previous owner has blacked out the windows. Apparently, it's quite difficult to remove them. So I'm in this vehicle and parked uh, somewhere in Gaul, I think we were trying to get fuel or something. And four young women, probably in their mid-twenties, walked past and they immediately, seeing these blacked out windows, made a very loud kaputa ka, ka, kaputa <laughs> Talking about keeping mouths shut, you don't use a smartphone, do you? No. So is that uh, now, I, I understand that when the family assembles, yeah. it's your daughter who says, put the phone away. Now, yes, yes. But, but never to me, because actually this is put away. It's, it's on a chair back there. I you see. Know? I mean, I have it close by, but I don't. But, but after lunch, when I have my nap, it's switched off. For two hours, it's switched off. From 1.30 to 3.30, you will never reach me. Do you have a general disdain for technology? Or is it that uh, the phone? No, no, actually, I... I I love technology, I'm a mathematician, remember? So I'm on the science side of things, not really on the arts. So I do have a, but I can see, I have a very addictive personality. There was a time at school, we used to gamble, you know, on, on little chips. And I can see myself getting so absorbed in it that it'll take me over. So I can see that these things are very addictive. Yeah, you check your Facebook quite regularly, so. Well, about once every... <laughs> no, 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 you no, do. Uh, no, you when, do. When, I, when I put an entry, when I put an entry, then I check it for the next week. But how often do I put an entry on my Facebook? <laughs> <I don't. laughs> Maybe once every two say. weeks? Yes. <laughs> that sounds very legal, putting an entry into Facebook. That's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like almost going to a well, police well, station. To me, it's a huge occasion when I put something up. Huge yeah. occasion. Yeah. Oh my God, 600 people have seen this. <laughs> Coming up to jazz, I have a, a son who's just turned 21. He says that he wants to do everything differently, yet he drives my 20-year-old Land Cruiser, which is a manual um, vehicle. Uh, he uh, borrows my records, which are LP records that uh, I bought uh, from the time of Sanjay in London. And uh, he shuns social media to an extent where he takes composed photographs on film, scans it and posts it. So are we seeing a change? Are we seeing young people embracing? I mean, when you look at jazz and when you listen to jazz and see some of the new jazz coming through, there are so, such strong echoes of the past of vintage music and so on. What, what, what is your feeling and what's your genre? What do you enjoy? The, I mean, for sure, I mean, on that first part of the question, we're definitely seeing so many vintage throwbacks. I mean, I think the 90s is quite now big with people who are like 16 or so. And then definitely amongst the 20 year olds, LPs, all of that, um, you know, as you said, taking photos on film. That's all coming back now because it's, it's a, I guess, a slow pace of life uh, compared to like how quick things are really and how they would have grown up with, you know, having access, access to phones and stuff. But yeah, uh, jazz. Um, oh, sorry. Hold that question? thought. Hold that thought because the food might be getting cold. Now, <laughs> I heard about your massive lunch. Your words, not mine. Yeah. So, may I interest you in uh, um, maybe sweet? Or most, savory. Most surely, something savory. Perhaps. Something yes. savory. Okay. And you know, tea goes incredibly well with any type of food because tea emulsifies the fats and okay. it balances the sugars. So you can have any of these completely guiltless. Nothing to worry. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure? Absolutely. You sure? Uh, <laughs> absolutely. And I'm going to send you the science. So try it, try it. So, but no, no milk and sugar in your tea. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So getting back to jazz. You must repeat the question because I totally went off on a tangent. No problem. Like jazz. You are you are absolutely allowed to be distracted <laughs> by pies and by, by, yeah, by beauty. And so <laughs> um, specifically Leading into it. jazz. Yeah. Um, lots of jazz, it has echoes of uh, vintage uh, um, music of different genres, but um, is it that there is an absence of originality in some of the new jazz, or is it that this is what um, listeners want to hear? Oh, I think it's, it's hints of nostalgia plus an amalgamation of everything that's kind of come before. Oh, what do you mean by, well, I... Um, <sighs> You know, to be honest with you, I don't listen to a lot of new jazz. It's very much everything from like the 20s going into the 50s as well. And all of that music was, you know, based around feeling, based on spirituals that have come before. People were basically suffering under um, or racism and then poverty around them. So that kind of ignited this fire that was jazz. Um, I, so I think even currently now with modern music, we're looking back further you know and trying to i think there is like maybe a certain lack of originality which is why we have to look back to other decades to get our inspiration for but at the other uh, on the other hand we are sort of making it our own thing too so you know it's a bit of both a bit of both nostalgia as well as wanting to create something original is it that society expects a constant stream of new things and human nature is not simply not able yeah, to. Yeah, I don't think it, we're able to like sort of catch up. I mean, you see it even like in news cycles, you know, something pops out and then it's like viral for about, what, 72 hours and then everything dies down and people kind of move on to the next thing. So it's like that, 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 that. And I think looking back on previous decades and the music then, it's carefully considered, you know, I feel like disco is still like a huge thing like now even, and we turn back to their music because it's still great music and I think it's because people took time over it, for sure. Now, you know, we have to keep churning out things and over and over and over again, and it's annoying. Now, you didn't believe me when I told you that tea emulsifies fats. If you try that pie and you get a little bit of the fatty deposits on your palate, take a sip of your English breakfast tea, <laughs> you will then see for yourself what's going to happen. But you're a purist where Builder's Tea is concerned, I think, because more recently, I uh, visited friends in London and there was this tea bag that went unceremoniously into a, a mug, followed by uh, hot, lukewarm water, followed by cold milk. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was left there, completely neglected for all of about 60 seconds, then a stir and a um, uh, a sip, you know, that is probably the most vile combination and process that <laughs> I've ever me, seen. But trust me, it's only vile because of the lukewarm water. If that water had been boiling and you left it for 60 seconds, it would have been perfect. Yes, but whether you are a milk in first person or a milk in last person, still when you add the cold milk, you make whatever it is lukewarm. And so you, you make it vile in any case. That's true. That, yeah, it does bring, bring the temperature down. I don't find it makes, I mean, you know, I don't put the milk in first. It always has to go in last because then you can actually watch the tea change in color and you know when to, when to stop. But anyway, I don't like my tea boiling hot because it just calls my mouth. It has to be not lukewarm, but somewhere in the upper registers of that. But actually, there's a question for you. I, I always sort of think, how long do you brew, brew it for? Or how, how long do you leave that sort of tea bag in for and let it sort of sit? Like, what's the recommendation? You know, that is so, the answer to that is so elusive. If you look <laughs> amongst <laughs> all of the explanations of how to brew tea from England, that actually it is as simple as, um, of course, good tea, uh, good water. Good water is spring water or yes, water yes. without an excess of calcium. Definitely not London water, which is yes. ridiculously <laughs> mineral rich. And then it is uh, hot, freshly boiled water. So it's around 94 degrees. Combine the tea and the water in the right proportion so that you have 200 mils of water to the tea bag. And then you stir because the tea has to come into contact with the water to be able to, to, to give out its... Yeah. Absolutely. So the extraction process requires of brewing is extraction. So then they, it needs a minimum of three minutes. If you're going to add milk, as your dad obviously did. Um, it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Sorry. 
shocking. Um, five minutes at least, mm. because any good food or drink must have a balance of flavors and textures. So to get the balance, you need to be able to. You see, this that. is my point. The milk has to balance it out, and the sugar. <laughs> I'm telling the wrong person. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's. Uh, no, I, I can't. You, you won't that, get the builder out of me. You can try, but. <laughs> Now tell me, going back to that time, yeah. how does a mathematician become a writer or on, on the way to, on the, the, on the road to writing, becomes also a builder? How did that happen? I think this is something I, I need to tell anyone and everyone. If you, you have to keep your mind open. And that's something we in Sri Lanka really don't do well at all. We are so stratified and so, uh, sort of our minds Doctor. are very one track. Lawyer, 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 accountant, lawyer. you know. You mentioned that this is what you wanted Q to be, right? Maybe that is a joke. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in another parallel world, I'd love her to be a doctor and for me to sit back and relax in my old age and she so keeps paying all my bills. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So, no, the thing is, is, so if the other point is that we Sri Lankans, I think across the board, we're so hugely talented. I don't know what this is. Something in the water supply, you know. Uh, but what prevents us is other people laughing at us, telling us we're not good at it. And we're very good at that as well. You know, we're very good at sniggering and putting people down. So if you keep an open mind and you're a complete ingenue and you decide, I'm going to try this and let's see, you know, and it's best to do it quite anonymously so that other people aren't able to put you down, uh, you find or one finds that one can do all these things. You know, it's not that much of a training that you need and you learn, you train on the job. You have a, you have a beautiful insight into what it is to be Sri Lankan. So I want to ask you a question. In the last few days, we have seen Q's generation showing us what is great about Sri Lanka. Because I remember reading, um, I think it was a, probably a, not a very great piece of literature, but by um, Colin De Silva, I think it was, where he talked, where he, his preface was, Sri Lanka is a country with a glorious past, an undecided present, and uh, a lost future. Words to that effect. Mm -hmm. Ashok, you have incredible insight into what it means to be Sri Lankan. Now, people say that uh, Sri Lanka is pregnant with possibility. Some people say that Sri Lanka doesn't have much of a future, but this generation, has shown us that we may actually be on the cusp of something great in harnessing that potential. What do you think? I couldn't agree more, Dilan. Uh, um, I've been back 34 years and we've, I've seen, I personally have seen almost everything that the country has thrown at us. Revolutions, JVP, uprisings, tsunamis, civil wars, the lot. But I think this is the first time I have felt a glimmer that we are on to something new. And it's thanks to the younger generation. And, and I think they had, they're much more focused than we are. They're less cynical than we are. We have been through so much that we tend to be very cynical and think, ah, well, it's another flash in the pan. We'll go back down again afterwards. That's what's happened up to now. But this is the first time I feel, gosh, I'm so impressed with this lot. You know, they're all there, they're all out there, they're helping each other, they're watching each other's backs, as you saw. Do you know, there's so much of that camaraderie, but it's more than camaraderie, it's teamwork. It is uh, truly something uh, extraordinary. Now tell me, do you dunk your biscuit in your tea? Oh, I used to. I used to ginger nuts in, in there, or digestives. I prefer ginger nuts, actually. So does that corrupt the tea or but does it, it, does. it uh, enhance me. the tea? It <laughs> corrupts you. <laughs> you know? but, but it's wonderful. It's an all-in-one experience, you see. <laughs> I, I'm not a purist. As I keep saying, teamwork. The ginger nut, tea, milk, sugar. Teamwork. It's That's an interesting <laughs> person. Oh, but you see know, his face falling. Yes, I know. I know. You got the wrong man here. As a <laughs> tea like taster, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm really lost for words because as a tea taster, it's very hard to It's agree. very hard to. But, but trust me. It's still the same tea, and as long as it gives the same joy, equal amounts of joy to you as well as to me, you know, the purist as well as the complete, what shall I call it, the corrupt, you know? What does it matter at the end of the day that that tea is achieving its purpose? There is no joy like 
a good English breakfast with a brownie, a nice rich chocolate brownie or a macaron. No, it's true. You're, you're right. But, but what you forget is that's the sugar. That's I know, but the tea synthesizes the sugar, so you don't have to worry about the sugar. It's true. It's true. I, I prefer to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> An all-in-one. A lump rye, if you like. You have a, a beautiful synergy, the two of you. <laughs> what? Is this only because of the camera? Or how is it at home? Oh my god. Oh my god, it's worse. <laughs> As yeah. I know, it's not even synergy. It's, it's like me barking at him half the time the because he's done something stupid or he said something stupid. I don't know why my family seems to think that I do stupid things you all do the time. You do, all the time. They, they make perfect sense to me, but not to anyone else. But if you're doing stupid things like this, can you please do more? <laughs> Yes, there you are. Listen to him. Listen to the man. Don't encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what's next. Uh, there's another book in my head, but a sort of a book. And, and I don't, I'm a real lazy so and so when it comes to writing. I wait and wait and wait two, three years. Then I sit and it comes out really quickly. But I, I'm being told, I've been told, and I saw the other day at a book club, oh, you're prolific. Six books in a quarter of a century. I don't think that's prolific, but they felt it was. It's just that I think I try and leave it so long in the head that when it comes out, it's very quick and there's almost no editing. I mean, that book is virtually unedited. There's almost nothing in there that's, that's been uh, jigged, rejigged. For the benefit of aspiring young writers, can you just give us a little bit of insight into your process? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I think, I mean, for young writers, the biggest thing, I mean, there, there are two, two, two things that, that are very difficult for a young person to do. One is to lose your self-consciousness because you have all these aunties watching you. So if you write about an alcoholic, that means you must be an alcoholic, no child. You're obviously, you know, or, or you're this or you're a thief or whatever. Everyone assumes you're a thief. It's a small place. So it's very difficult to write out there what you really want to write. It's tamed by your fear. And if it's tamed physically, the writing is too tame. It will not survive. So first thing, lose your subconsciousness. I lose your self-consciousness. Second, more important, you need to be able to tap into your subconscious. What is really you? What is in there? And that's very difficult to do. Clearly, Oxford mathematics isn't a big part of you because I don't see much of it, at least the books, your books that I've read or read of, don't mm, really To be fair, like, he, I think Cease the Shadow of Demons, you had done something like quite akin to mathematics as in how you structured it. Yeah, actually, almost all of them have a mathematical structure. But because mathematics to a non-believer is very ugly, to me, it's not. It's the most beautiful thing on earth. And still, uh, for me, it's my number one thing. Um, because it's so ugly to a non-believer, you have to disguise it. It's like the skeleton underneath the, 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 underneath the flesh. So if you like the mathematics, it's the skeleton. And then as an author, you spend your life covering it up with the flesh. So that what the reader sees is the person walking. What you see is the skeleton walking, you know, but hopefully they don't. If they see it, then your job isn't done. There you are. So we have here a ginger chai. Ginger chai for me, yes. Thank you so much. That's yours. And we have a cinnamon chai. Thank the you best of Ceylon. Ceylon oh, tea and goodness, Ceylon cinnamon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, Ooh. please continue. Yeah, so, so the, the, there is a, a kind of fashion in all the arts and the sciences uh, for people to wear their heart on their sleeve. So you design a building like this. What you're really saying is, look at me, how marvelous I am. I'm able to construct a building that doesn't seem to be able to stand. Do you know? Whereas the artist, I feel, conceals that. So it's only at the second layer when you stop to think, you think, oh my God, how on earth does this building stand up? You know, it's, it's an opposite philosophy. You, you hide your strengths and you leave it for people to, to discover. I was thinking more of Oxford and Oxford is a place that leaves a, a tremendous impression and for anyone who has been there, I find that in many cases they can't stop talking about it. Now it irritates the heck out of me because I went to a place where all the Oxbridge wannabes go, which is the LSE, oh, LSE down yes. the road. Yes. Now um, 
how is it that Oxford doesn't feature prominently in your writing whilst uh, Colombo and uh, England do so much? Um, it, it may in the future. I, I tend to pick little areas of, of my life and then work a novel around it. Um, and Oxford is one of those things that I haven't really, hasn't really figured. Um, that is not to say it didn't mean a lot to me, it did hugely. Um, certain things happened and the sheer life there. I think again, I was quite lucky. It was the Oxford of an earlier generation where it was very tough to get into. It wasn't just on a letter you wrote. You had this incredibly tough Oxbridge exam, then you had a general paper, then you had an interview. Now, you represent um, the future in a very real sense, as a woman, as a successful uh, entertainer, as someone with incredible creativity. Um, two questions. Um, a, where do you see the future? Because it's very easy to get uh, lost or subdued by the present. And uh, B, um, what's next in your future? Oh, okay. Well, so for the first one, future is in what's uh, the future of Sri Lanka, do you think? Or is that... The future, <laughs> yes, the future, not uh, for, for, for women, for your generation in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka. Oh, I think it just already depends on the next couple of weeks. And I, I feel so hesitant to answer that because it can go any one way, really. Um, I'm trying not to be, I'm a panicker. Well, I'm sorry, I'm a panicky individual. So I'm like, oh, this is not going very well, is it? I don't know. But I, and there's a bit of me that also has a bit of optimism, really, that it will get better. And definitely, it's kind of like breaking apart everything and now trying to put it all back together. And I'm sure in that new future, we have more women work in the workforce. We have more women at the forefront leading this country as well. That, of course, is my greatest wish and hope. Um, the second, what's in my future? Uh, I, I really want to use this year and really to perform and do more with my singing, really, and really develop as a singer. I don't feel like you ever stop learning, whatever stage you're at. So I'm definitely in this space of wanting to get better as a performer. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I can't really plan now, like a year ahead, so I just do three months or like two days now <laughs> with the current situation. <laughs> so You've been described as multi-talented and I, I think that's not misplaced having heard you a while back at uh, Vertical. I must say that that is undoubtedly the case. But tell me, um, it, it's not a great time for entertainers because the hospitality industry is affected by so many factors. So what do you do um, beyond the uh, ordinary, I mean beyond the, uh, I shouldn't call it ordinary, but beyond the writing, the, the performing? Is there something new that's a, a project that excites you? Oh, well, I mean... Uh, Social media, something digital, uh, different well, channel? Yeah, to be, to be fair, like I, I work with the ARCA Initiative, which is a sexual health organization we work on. So we try and provide tangible and practical solutions to people here to help them with sexual health education. So bit by bit, we're trying to also bridge the gaps in everybody's knowledge because I feel sexual health knowledge is very, very important. Here. I must add that ARCA, we have worked with them and I have met yeah. with them on a couple of occasions. I love them because they did a fantastic session on reproductive mm -hmm. health on several of our plantations and they are awesome. And also one of the reasons why I would disagree with you that we should uh, not be anything but totally optimistic. I know I'm a bit of a panicker myself, <laughs> but um, sitting, thinking, meeting people like you, you then understand why there is reason for optimism. Now, before we wrap up, I need you to take a sip of this. Uh, I mean, it, this yeah, is it, amazing. It pains me. <laughs> it really hits, pains me to do this that. Hits, oh, like, though, this I'm gonna, hits. and you know, I'm gonna stick to what's conventional, oh, this is just, just so to avoid nice. the wrath of my father in case he ever does watch this. <laughs> it's delicious. But it's, what's your father's favorite from all? He of likes uh, an early in the morning, and as I always remind him, and in fact, he he probably taught me this at the beginning. You should never have a favorite tea. You should have a tea that you have 
with your brisket, you should have a tea that you have with uh, your chocolate, etc., uh, etc. Et <laughs> and a tea for every mood, a tea for jazz. A tea for jazz. Tea for jazz. We did. We did some music pairing. We oh. had a, a, a tea for Wagner, which was an angry tea. Then we oh had a, a tea that uh, tea. went with Strauss, which was a very uh, a light, delicate uh, Norelia, and we built this whole thesis around music and tea, tea yeah. and music. Mm. And uh, it was, it, it, it is a part of what we call the school of tea. But wow. I mean, it's a grape. Exactly. And there's science to back that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it does it, and they both together conspire to improve your mood, yeah, which exactly. ultimately is what every what we're after. Hosp that's hospitality, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 That's true. Ashok, Q, thank you. It has been extraordinary. Yeah having an afternoon with you and particularly uh, over thank tea. Both. And oh, for no, thank delicious you both. For all the food, thank which you. we will definitely eat afterwards, <laughs> just not on camera. <laughs> and when we knock the cameras off. Knock the camera off for now. Allowed so to we got to finish off. this. <laughs> Can you show us how you dunk? Just uh, oh, yes. maybe while yes. the camera is still Oh rolling. my goodness, I think so, one of these would dunk best. Yeah, so this yeah. is not a ginger nut. Yes, uh, sadly uh, not a ginger nut, but it, yeah. looks, it looks very, very... So you do it in the regular tea or the milk tea? Uh, no, well, it, 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 well, I think I'm okay. either, but this has all this other stuff on top, so I right. prefer okay. to do it in there. So you have, there's an art, is it, to making sure mm. that it doesn't crumble and fall halfway mm. through? Exactly. Right. Or even if just half of that falls in there, it doesn't matter. You drink so now, are you eating or drinking? What is the definition both? of what you just both? did? You're doing both. Yes. Excellent. You're Multitasking. Both. Excellent. And you're making more efficient use of your time. Mm. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> what are the... <laughs> 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 cheers, 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 cheers. cheers.